Hello. Uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, Peter Shebek. Uh, Peter has been working uh, professionally with Python for nearly a decade, and now he is going to talk about where good engineering practices would save the day. So please welcome Peter. Imagine that uh, you got to your work, prepared a coffee, sit by your table, and sighed deeply to regain strength for the next uh, hard day. You open your monitor, uh, and alerting is shouting at you. Uh, customers are calling you, and uh, it's just crazy start of the day. And now it's your turn to save the day, but uh, it's too late. You should start months earlier. Hi, I'm Petr Šebek, and I will talk, uh, tell you about three uh, cases of software failure with horrible consequences. First, uh, a few words about my company. Uh, I work at Threatmark, and we are protecting end users uh, like we all are uh, against fraud and other threats. Uh, threats, uh, so I have so read, uh, read uh, slides because we are protecting about threat. And uh, we have everything built on Python, everything with modern technologies, and there is even some AI, but not just the regex one, as we saw in the morning, but uh, really AI. But uh, to, the first, uh, to the first story. First story is about Knight Capital uh, and software bug that cost them $440 million. Knight Capital was a quite big American global financial services company, and it was uh, doing market making, electronic execution, institutional sales, and uh, it really uh, did a lot of trades. It, uh, at one day, it created like 3 billion trades uh, and traded $21 billion a daily, so it was really big at the time. On August 1st, 2012, uh, the Faulty program bought $7 billion worth of stocks right after of open, and since uh, it was faulty and it was for incorrect price, it moved the price uh, so big, that so significantly, that they weren't able to sell the position for the same price as they bought it. And yeah, so let's look what actually happened there. Uh, New York Stock Exchange uh, came with a great idea. We have uh, this new mean of trading uh, called retail liquidity program. Only uh, our traders or our market makers have only 30 days uh, to finish it, which is not enough on such a big thing. So uh, Knight Capital engineers uh, hastily started to making changes. Uh, even on their most important component, SMARS, which is a smart market access routing system, which is uh, something that uh, can create thousands of orders per second and send it to uh, dozens of different venues. Night, in, Night Capital engineers decided that they will reuse uh, some feature flag because uh, it wasn't used anymore, so they decided why not. So for the new feature RLP, they decided uh, they will use uh, the old code for PowerPack. PowerPack uh, was an obscure algo that uh, was never meant to uh, be running at production, and it was only for testing purposes. What it did uh, was that it was uh, only pushing price up and up or down and down, so it was completely useless when you wanted to make money, right? And uh, it was still in the, in the code, but uh, like everybody forgot about it because it wasn't used uh, for nine years, it wasn't tested. And when something is not tested and uh, you do refactoring, uh, you will break it. And uh, they broke it during the time. They, uh, the PowerPack algorithm had lost the abil ability to uh, actually know how many stocks it, actually, it bought. So it was uh, running in endless loop, buying more and more and more, because it didn't know that uh, it bought something. OK? It was just for test, right? Not so exactly. 
another problem uh, was that uh, before that August 1st, uh, they needed to deploy the new code. So uh, they did what they do uh, every time. Uh, one tired engineer deployed it out to using like a list of manual steps and uh, it failed, obviously. It failed because he didn't manage to deploy it on the eighth server, on the uh, one of the servers. So uh, the day actually have uh, started and they uh, are started to getting uh, those RLP orders, but the aid server thought that, ah, uh, PowerPack, PowerPack uh, should be used. So uh, it uh, called PowerPack and PowerPack uh, was uh, spitting out of orders uh, in that endless loop. They actually noticed quite fast, well, after a few minutes, they even got a, a memo from uh, New York Stock Exchange that something is weird with your volume. Uh, but uh, the code, it was so much faster. It, uh, it was uh, really, really fast based on that uh, really performant smart system. So at this point, they were like uh, really uh, scared what is happening and uh, what uh, should they do? Should they uh, shut it down? They didn't have any uh, procedures what to do in such cases. So they investigated, which is wrong, and they decided uh, not to shut it down, but uh, another uh, good idea that sometimes help, to do a rollback. So now they rollbacked all eight servers to the previous code. So now all eight servers were spitting out of orders. So they actually made the worst decision ever. So please, rollback is not always the best decision. After like uh, another 20 minutes, they found out that uh, Smars is the culprit and uh, they shut it down, everything. And, but the worst day of their life uh, just, was just beginning. How did uh, how this resulted? The pack uh, was able to create four million trades or over 154 stocks. Uh, they bought uh, or sold, uh, sold nearly 400 million shares, and they accrued the position of seven billion dollars of stocks they didn't want for a price they didn't want to pay for it. This moved the price significantly on uh, some stocks, even uh, over 80% of, of, uh, of, uh, of the price. So it was really a mess. They wanted to cancel those trades, but uh, it was like by the book uh, and it was their fault. So it wasn't can canceled uh, without, uh, with some exceptions. In the end, uh, their investor, Gold Goldman Sachs, uh, stepped in. They bought the unwanted position from them and made them pay $440 million. And, but this was uh, such a big blow for their reputation that uh, they uh, just uh, was acquired by their arrival next year and uh, the company was gone. <laughs> what can we uh, learn from this? Because I don't want to just scare you, I want you to learn something from, uh, from the fact that it happened. So at first, if there would be no power pack code uh, in their code base, nothing of this would happen. So there is actually no excuses for a dead code, for commented out code, for something that is never called. It should just not be in your code base. First, you aren't gonna need it uh, like ever. And second, if you ever need it, you will find it in your version control. So please just delete all code you doesn't use. And if you use something, uh, have, a, have a, a tests running on it. Another thing is that manual deployment is a recipe for disaster. It's just uh, what it is. Uh, when you are doing it, you will make a, a so-called human error and uh, you will mess up something very badly. So only manual step in your deployment should be pressing the button deploy here, and that's all. Okay, sometimes you have to have manual steps in your deployment, but then somebody else should be there working with you, being your backup, and it really helps tremendously when you are not alone on such important things. And third, 
big change requires time, of the surprise. So the bigger the change you are doing to your critical system and hastier it is done, the bigger the risk there is. And you never know where, where on, and when it manifests. So please, uh, if you are doing something hastily, be aware that this will happen or let your manager know that it will happen. Story number two is about Boeing 737 MAX. Uh, it happened like three years ago, so I guess uh, most of you remembers what happened. Boeing is an uh, American airline uh, company. Uh, they have market capitalization over $90 billion, and together with Airbus, they are controlling the airplane market. So, uh, in 2018 and 2019, uh, two fatal crashes happened and 346 people died. This resulted in all their planes being grounded for 20 months and uh, it is estimated that it cost them $20 billion uh, in direct costs, costs and uh, $60 billion in indirect costs like uh, reputation and stocks and, and such. Let's see what happened. Boeing 737 is a very successful airplane that was uh, uh, in, uh, in air since 1966. And it's actually in fourth generation right now. The third generation, NG, uh, is, uh, was a very well accepted uh, airplane and uh, really successful. But Boeing needed to stay competitive uh, against Airbus, so they decided we need more power and uh, they uh, put more powerful engines to the plane, as you can see on the uh, right image. But uh, the more powerful, uh, more powerful engine uh, had a tiny quirk that it was uh, causing the head of a plane to rising a bit, which is kind of problem when it's not stable. So it could end up, uh, if it would rise too, too up, it could actually, the plane could stall and fall down. So it's really a uh, really big problem. What uh, was option was just to redesign the plane, uh, like the whole, whole plane, so it can actually have those more powerful engines. No, uh, Boeing had another idea. Boeing uh, decided that the, uh, they will call software to the rescue because software is much cheaper than hardware, right? So they uh, came up with a maneuvering characteristic augmentation system. Software that uh, looks, uh, reads uh, data from angle of attack sensor, which is a tiny wing on the plane hole, which moves with the direction of airflow. If the uh, reading from this, uh, from this uh, sensor rises too up or the angle is too high, MCAS activates and actually uh, rotates horizontal tail and uh, make nose uh, down, um, push it down. So it uh, actually, as a pilot, you wouldn't uh, even notice that uh, something is happening there. Yeah. Uh, Another problem was that uh, pilots weren't aware, uh, weren't aware of the MCIS and uh, they just hadn't, uh, they didn't have a chance to know that because they didn't get uh, proper training. They just uh, got an hour long uh, iPad presentation because Boeing wanted to have those planes like NG and MAX, uh, like they are completely the same. You don't have to learn anything new. And uh, in this presentation, MCAS wasn't mentioned and even the uh, plane manual. There was like no, nothing. No, no one knew about uh, MCAS uh, if they didn't uh, dig too deep. And MCAS had, it is, had its issues as we know now. Uh, for first, uh, it was reading only one uh, angle of attack uh, sensor. It's uh, on the image. Uh, but uh, on the plane there are two, so it wasn't redundant at all. It was just reading uh, one of it. And uh, there was no cockpit warning light for angle of attack discrepancy. Uh, it meant that uh, when those two sensors uh, not agreed together, 
uh, pilots didn't know. And first, it can malfunction as everything in our world can. Uh, it can freeze, it can get hit by a bird or something else. It's just a little thing outside of uh, plane holes, so um, you cannot make it 100%. Uh, these things uh, manifested in the in crashes, and uh, as we uh, as we saw, it uh, took 346 people. Uh, and we can see on this graph that uh, right sensor was uh, uh, okay; it was reading the data correctly. But uh, after a few minutes uh, after takeoff, uh, the last sensor was completely wrong and off, and uh, it was activating MCAS uh, over and over. Pilots were trying to uh, keep the altitude, but uh, the airplane was fighting against them, and they uh, failed or they crashed eventually. And but they did everything by the book, uh, as was uh, as they had from Boeing. We can learn something even from airplanes. So, uh, lessons number one is that uh, every time you do, always think about single point of failure. It's easier said than done, I know it. But uh, you should always try to think about it. Uh, what can go wrong? What will happen if this one thing just fails? Even you cannot imagine it will fail. Uh, from now on, uh, though that uh, MCS is reading from two angle of attack sensors and not just only one. Lesson number two is uh, that uh, we shouldn't hide critical information from our users. Uh, I know it's complicated to uh, prepare UI that is uh, uh, good for our uh, customers, that uh, everything is there, but um, Nevertheless, uh, we shouldn't hide information about how autopilot is pushing uh, nose of your plane down, right? So uh, another thing, when you have MCAS in your plane and you are pilot, uh, you should know it. So please uh, inform your users that something that can harm them is in your system. And third lesson is uh, we shouldn't cut corners regarding safety and security. This means uh, that uh, there is uh, an unlimited uh, downside in uh, when you do this. So you should be really careful when you are doing some trade-offs in these areas. Third, third story is about Toyota. Toyota is a Japanese uh, manufacturer, car manufacturer, actually a lean manufacturer pioneer and uh, they have market capitalization over $200 billion. Uh, and they had uh, this uh, problem that in the first decade of this century, Toyota cars uh, experienced an uh, issue called sudden unintended acceleration, which is that you are not pressing uh, gas pedal, but your car is uh, speeding up. It was happened uh, by design of the car because the accelerator pedal uh, was getting stuck in floor mat. Uh, it was actually made of wrong material, so it could uh, stay in halfway up. But there were also software issues, and we will focus on that because we are software engineers, right? This resulted in at least 89 deaths. It also resulted in multiple fines, and uh, Toyota had to pay over $2 billion uh, in fines, uh, one for, for criminal penalty and uh, another half for case settlements. They uh, had to settle 400 uh, uh, cases regarding wrongful death or injury. So it's really not what you want to be responsible for. We will focus on one case uh, that uh, happened in 2007. And it's uh, about two women who were uh, leaving Interstate Highway and uh, they lost throttle control. And they tried to brake uh, any means possible by using uh, a parking brake or normal brake, but uh, they even left a 48, uh, 45 meter long uh, skid mark but they eventually crashed into embankment and one of the uh, women died 
and another uh, was recovering for five months. We are uh, focusing on this case because there were two embedded uh, engineers that, that were um, uh, inspecting the code for 20 months. They uh, found out that uh, Toyota was following some coding standards uh, called uh, Misra C, which is some recommendation how to write your uh, critical system. And there is a rule of thumb that for every 30 rule violations, there will be three minor bug, bug and uh, one major. The engineers uh, found uh, over 80,000 violations. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, it's a high score or something, I don't know. Another thing was that uh, uh, their main, of, uh, main way to pass uh, values was global variables. So they were over uh, 11,000 of them. And the uh, code was complex as hell. Uh, there is nice uh, metric called uh, cyclomatic complexity, which is number of independent paths through a function. So if you have a single if-else branch in your function, the cyclomatic complexity is two. It is recommended to keep your, uh, keep your functions of uh, complexity below 10, I guess. So yeah, naturally there were multiple of over 50 complexity, which is completely untestable. And the function that interests us most, uh, setting structural angle, had complexity 146, which is 146 independent paths through a function which is something you cannot test, you cannot understand, and it will fail. And it did. There is a, uh, so authors actually not just uh, was worried about the code uh, in general, but uh, they actually simulated the error. There was a path uh, where uh, there is some routine task X, which was reading accelerator, uh, accelerator pressing down. It was writing it to variable, global of course, uh, then it was read by a motor control task and uh, motor control task would uh, use the uh, open throttle. But the task could die quite easily and while it was dead, the uh, variable wasn't updated at all. So if you uh, was unlucky, uh, it, was, it died when you pressed the uh, gas pedal and uh, the motor would just uh, speed up uh, even you were trying to brake. Of course, there was a fail safe. There was something that was uh, uh, watching for that, uh, that task. It's called watchdog and it's something that uh, tells that uh, your application is that should it close the program. And they had it, but it was incapable of detecting that of majority of tasks. So it wasn't uh, like doing a thing. Uh, in the end, they uh, were able to simulate the crash, what happened there, and uh, Toyota obviously lost the case. They had to pay $3 million uh, to, to uh, one, one woman and a uh, family of the second. Uh, global variables are considered harmful since 1973, so it's, uh, it will be 50 years next year, so please, uh, I don't know, we, we just know it for so long, we know it for decades, don't use them, don't pass information through global variables. If you don't understand the code, you will introduce a bug. Uh, it's just the fact you don't, you cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, uh, good enough to not introduce it. So if you found something you don't understand, uh, refactor it, simplify it, uh, write unit tests for it so you know what's happening. You should always test that uh, your failsafe works because otherwise it's not failsafe, it's uh, nothing. And uh, you should admit the problem before more harm is done because then more people can uh, get hurt. That's our three stories, and I have now some final thoughts. Uh, we heard about three, uh, three stories, about uh, Knight Capital lost a lot of money, uh, Boeing and uh, Toyota caused numerous deaths. I guess most of us are don't writing critical system when uh, someone can get hurt. 
but we are writing systems uh, which some people are de uh, dependent on, like our users, our employer, or we and our reputation. So we should, uh, we should uh, take the responsibility and be responsible for the quality of the product. If uh, someone is hand-waving uh, our concerns, we should uh, just push back. On the other hand, we should know about the business uh, side of the coin and we should know reasons of both. But we are the one who are responsible. And another thing, you will make mistakes. That's good, we are learning from mistakes uh, and it's important to actually learn from them, not just make them, right? <laughs> And third, uh, we should have a clean code mindset, uh, meaning like we should always strive to write a code that is cleaner, that is more safer than yesterday, and we should learn from our mistakes. Thank you, that's all. And maybe uh, if you want to uh, have want to make uh, some more, uh, write into YouTube, let's deploy to production and watch it. It's really a gem. Uh, thanks. Uh, there are a few questions, so I will read them. Was there a good reason to use uh, numeric flags for identifying features instead of relying on string identifiers in the protocol? I actually don't know. Uh, I read the paper and it wasn't uh, uh, discussing this detail, but it was in, written in uh, early 2000s, so different standards were used back then and uh, strings weren't so much uh, common. Thanks. Uh do you think the Boeing story also teaches us about the potential consequences of incomplete documentation in mission critical systems? Sure, yeah. Uh, documentation is uh, the same part as your code uh, of the solution, but it al also has to be uh, readable and approachable. If you have like uh, 1000 pages long documentation and somewhere there is written, oh, and Maybe you will, uh, you will die if this crashes. It doesn't help anybody. So it should be part of it and it should be a really uh, important part of uh, your product. Uh, is there any programming paradigm that enforces coding standards by its nature? Uh, for example, functional programming encourages not to use global variables. Yeah, there are... Um, some, uh, some that will encourage you to write more cleaner code. For example, Rust is a great example uh, for embedded, uh, embedded solutions. So I guess that uh, functional programming uh, can be a way for some problems, but uh, in the end, uh, there are uh, you behind the screen and uh, when you will make the, uh, the problem, well, when you will make the error, it will just manifest and uh, people will die. So <laughs> actually, uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, there are some, uh, some things that uh, you can do to be uh, more, th there can be a safety net, but uh, there is always like a common reason uh, behind that. Uh, so you should actually think about what can go wrong. But yeah, that's all. Okay, and the last one. Don't you think Toyota's subject was also political since it only happened in the USA? Oh. <laughs> yes, probably. I don't have for any information about it. <laughs> okay, so thank you, Peter, for your talk. Uh, thanks. So we have a coffee break. Uh, next talk will be in a more than a 15 minutes. In 15 minutes. Thank you.
Mikrobit je programovateľný milý počítač, ktorý ti dovolí prepojiť informatiku s kreativitou. Dá sa programovať veľmi jednoducho a ovládať tak, aby robil presne to, čo chceš. O pár minút sme zvládli rozsvietiť vlastný obrázok na displeji a o chvíľu sme už obrázky diálkovo prepínali druhým mikrobitom. Mikrobit má v sebe aj super vychytávky, ako sú tlačidlá, senzor pohybu, kompas a teplomé. K mikrobitu ale môžeš pripojiť množstvo ďalších vecí. Tu programujeme, aká animácia sa nám má ukázať na LED pásiku. Ja som na ňom naprogramovala dúhu. Teraz programujeme podľa nôd kohútika Jarabého. Najlepšie na mikrobite je, že si viem vytvoriť napríklad blikajúceho robota alebo gitaru, ktorú ovládam tak, že ňou zatraciem, alebo futbalovú bránku, kde mi mikrobit počíta, koľko gólov som dala, alebo kúlové svietiace topánky a tisíc ďalších vecí, ktoré ešte len vymyslím. Mikrobit je hračka, ktorú schováš do dlane a vytvoríš z nej čokoľvek. Tak čo s ňou spravíš ty? Každých 60 sekúnd si 28 tisíc ľudí predplatí službu Netflix. Odošle sa 197 miliónov e-mailov, stiahne sa 414 tisíc aplikácií a ukradne niekoľko tisíc hesiel. Na internete sa toho deje veľa. A všetko najdôležitejšie sa dozviete na Živé SK. Živé SK. Technológie ľudskou rečou.